Thank you, Siddharth, for being part of XRO podcast, and I'm your host, Eddie Avil. Today, I have Siddharth Warrior, who's a consultant neurologist and a YouTuber. He, uh, I went onto his Facebook page, and the Facebook headline was very, very cool. It reads, "Exploring the space where art, poetry, and neuroscience meet." So, so thank you, Siddharth. Really, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. So, so let me start with a quote by a neuroscientist and Nobel laureate, Santiago. Ramon so he says that every man can if he so desires become the sculptor of his own brain so some of the biggest leaders say the same thing but differently that we are actually the architects of our future so what are your views on that that is one of my favorite quotes uh, across not just neuroscience but across all of literature because uh, and like you said so many people have said it in different ways uh not just in literature but even in religion spirituality the idea that who we are is what you believe and our mind makes it real and uh our eyes cannot see what the mind does not know all these things are basically different ways of saying the same thing that if your brain isn't ready you will not experience it but as soon as your brain is ready for it you will experience it and uh, this is why it's uh, fascinating for me what uh, neuroscience is gearing up towards because our understanding of reality itself is being uh, thought of all over again because of our understanding of neuroscience can we actually sculpt our own brain can we sculpt our future where do we start how do we go about doing something like that uh i think that step 1 to uh, doing anything is understanding so understanding what it is that we are playing with understanding what happens in the brain so understanding how does reality form in our brain how do we experience reality that would be step 1 step 2 would be contemplating how can we now control our own experiences and step 3 would be how do we now modulate our own experiences so uh for me i think we are still very much in step 1 we are still trying to understand how does the brain interpret whatever is there around us so the things that we see touch hear smell taste how does our brain put all those units of information together and create the sense of reality how does it happen how does the brain do it i feel that we are still there and we still haven't completely understood that once we understand that then you can move on to now how can i control it and then you can go on to can i change it can i change reality and uh, this is without technology and what is interesting now is that uh, for the longest time the only technology we had was our brains but now we have other technologies we have ar we have vr so these are things that can help us modulate reality in the way we want it So uh for me that is a very interesting conversation and yeah. I'm glad that I'm here and I'm glad that uh, I think you are the right person to talk to about this. I got into virtual reality in early 2016 my nudge was matrix you know neo gets Morpheus asks <laughs> neo what is real <laughs> <laughs> what is real right so so yeah I, I obviously got into virtual reality because of that and then and I started reading and that's when I I got into a little bit of quantum physics and I was like what? the hell is going on what is you, you know, it, it's like a rabbit hole the more deeper you get in you get sucked in more you start questioning things and i am a very very curious curious person i mean uh, i used to sleep on my terrace and i used to look up at the night sky in the hope of seeing a ufo i had this whole fascination that i would go to bermuda triangle and, and i would get abducted by a ufo so so yeah I, i was but then yeah when i discovered we are and i was like oh wow what is real because mm. even right now a basic virtual reality experience like uh, uh, richie's plank walk tricks your motor cortex into believing that the virtual is real you know i, I don't know whether you have experienced the richie's plank walk is this experience where you get onto this elevator the you 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 come up uh, mm-hmm. on the top of the building the terrace and the terrace there's this plank and you need to step on the plank and walk and there are a lot of these malls who are, who you know yeah. give this experience and yeah. this experience you know before you actually 
do the experience you know that there's this plank right over here and, and nothing's going to happen but as soon as put the headset on the the experience itself it, it is mm. the the uh, the cg is extremely basic right there is it, it's I'm, nothing fancy but you you put the headset it pricks your motor cortex and you shake you tremble you cannot walk and, and so so that's that's it, it's tricking your motor cortex then we have something called as haptic feedback haptic feedback is nothing but your your phone's uh, vibration you know when, when mm-hmm. yeah so so taking the same principles there are companies who have created haptic feedback body suits gloves and stuff stuff like that and this is in a very very nascent stage but we are already nudging on on knocking on the door of reality and it, it, it's crumbling in in the near future when we have technology where we can read our entire brain how our 70 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses fires and wires will our reality be deeply questioned yes <laughs> yes it will and it should because if um, our reality doesn't change as knowledge grows then uh, there's something wrong so every time we have understood the universe a little better our reality has shifted so before we understood gravity our reality the way we looked at the universe was very different but then as soon as we understood the laws of gravity and uh newton's three laws we started looking at things differently similarly with uh, einstein's relativity similarly as we understand quantum physics similarly with neuroscience so the more we understand our reality should change because otherwise um, that means that we haven't understood it well enough so i i, I remember i'd gone to this um uh, gaming place called zero latency in bombay in uh, in lower parel and i had played this game where i had to shoot zombies and that was fun and in the middle of the game i had to cross from one building to the next uh, but from the terrace from the rooftop and there was only a plank uh, joining the two buildings and uh, there were four of us and we have to walk in a straight line and uh, later on after the game was over i saw the highlight videos and i could see like two of my friends fell down while crossing it was a perfectly flat ground but the the goggles make it real and uh, i could see people walking as if they were on a tight rope on a perfectly flat piece of ground and it was incredible to see how um, how your your senses if you change your input reality changes yeah yeah, yeah. that is something very very super so, so. probably awesome going on and and i wish we completely understand our brain so 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 let, let let's just i mean for my listeners can you just break down how the brain works and what are the different part of the brains and their functions think of it like a government like a democracy initially it's just individual tribes just doing their own stuff and then as evolution happened there's there was more and more of a shift towards a centralized thinking so there was a centralized structure that does all the thinking and the peripheral structures will now just obey commands so that's what happened with the brain that as evolution continued uh, and the uh, the brain started evolving upwards so on top of the spinal cord there developed more and more structures like the brain stem and then on top of that was the limbic system so the limbic system is where all the emotions are controlled and then it evolved still further and there there came about something called as the neocortex so the neo the word neo means new so neocortex is the latest brain evolution the limbic system has three layers and the neocortex has six and within the neocortex so within the so if you open your skull what you see is the neocortex and that is where the lobes are so if you've heard of the lobes of the brain that's how the brain is sort of divided so there are four main lobes right behind your forehead if you tap your the center of your forehead what you are tapping is the frontal lobe and if you tap just above your ears what you are tapping is the parietal lobe and if you tap behind at the back of your skull you are tapping the occipital lobe 
and sort of below your ears, if you're tapping, then that's the temporal lobe. So these are four lobes uh, on either side of the brain and there are two sides of the brain, right and left. This is the basic architecture, right? So below upwards is spinal cord, uh, brainstem, limbic system, and neocortex. There is a right and the left. And in the neocortex, sabse aage frontal lobe, then parietal, then occipital, and niche temporal. This is how the brain is organized. All of this is just neurons, it's just cells. The way they talk to each other decides what work they do. And each one of these areas has their own specific function, like a role to play. And if they're all playing it properly, then it all comes together to create our everything, consciousness, thinking, logic, all of that comes from all the neurons working together. So the frontal lobe is the most important one. Frontal lobe is where all the thinking happens, the logic, the personality, your calculation. So uh, your decision making. So when you wake up in the morning and you decide, uh, aaj kya karna hai? what should I have for breakfast? What is my plan today? All of that is in the frontal lobe. Right behind that is the parietal lobe, which is super important for uh, our conversation today in reality. I'll get to that. Behind that is the occipital lobe. That is where you see things. So all your vision and things that you see, everything is in the occipital lobe. And below your ear, the temporal lobe is where you hear things. And the temporal lobe is also containing an area called as the hippocampus. That is where all your memories are. So your identity and, uh, you know, where you went to school and uh, you mentioned 12th standard. So, okay, what were you doing in 12th standard? All of those memories are stored in your hippocampus. And uh, below that is the brainstem, which contains all the core functions in your body, like your heart rate, <coughs> uh, your blood pressure, your breathing, all that is controlled in your brainstem, right? So that's the rough overview of what each part does. And uh, the parietal lobe is, like I mentioned, important for reality because the parietal lobe is where all your sensations ultimately end up to give you a sense of three dimensional structures around you. So that is the job of the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe's main job is to tell you where you are. Right. That's it. Right. That's it. Wow. wow. We, we have been using EEG devices and stuff like that to kind of understand what's going on in the brain. Eventually, if we understand the language of the brain and if we can interpret that language onto maybe like a like a computer, maybe we'll be able to do a two-way communication. What possibly neural link is doing, or what possibly kernel is doing. So, so my question is, is there actually a language? Because I had the privilege to have a conversation with uh, uh, two startups who who are uh, who are fronting the brain computer interface for DARPA. And, and a oh, wow. non-invasive brain computer interface. And somehow they say that you don't necessarily need to understand what, what the firing and wiring is, is doing with the brain. But somehow I feel that if you understand the actual language and put it down and possibly like classify it, maybe you'll be, you'll be able to you know, actually do a two-way communication. Right? So, so, yeah, yeah. So, 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 anyway, you also mentioned about consciousness. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just getting a little vague and because I'm having fun. <laughs> so, so what is consciousness? How does it arise? Uh, and do you feel that machines will ever be conscious? So uh, the idea of... So both of your questions are actually very connected. Um, even the question about uh, language. Because... Uh, the one of the most important things to be aware about is that our understanding of something is limited by our own brains. Right. So even when we try to understand the brain, we are limited by our own language, by our own knowledge by our own perception, right? So that is why it is incredibly difficult because uh, I do believe that it is possible to understand the brain completely, 
but i also believe that we are nowhere close to it yeah the reason that i believe it is possible is because i believe that the brain is capable of infinite growth uh because that is what a biological computer does uh because our brain is a biological computer and it is capable of both software updates on a second to second basis and hardware updates maybe every few months that is literally what is going on wow so um the 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 computer chip that you are born with is not the computer chip that you have at 1 year of age or 5 years of age because the wiring changes so how your computer chips have gone from you know 10 mm to 7 mm to 7 nm to 5 nm like that is what is happening so more information can get stored in a smaller amount of space and that is what is happening in the brain so so you, you said our brain is a biological computer somehow i believe that also because if you see we've got trillions of cells in our body and all of them function because of electricity our mm-hmm. brains we, we 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 have some 70 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses they also function because of electricity because of you know uh, electricity firing so again again a vague question in some ways are we the artificial intelligence that we are trying to achieve are we machines in uh, yes yes so we are machines that uh, was created by biology itself and uh, from that perspective i don't think that computers are any different because they are also machines created by biology which is us we assume that it's a yes or no question but it's not yeah maybe a, maybe nothing is yes or no you know that's exactly. that, that's that's the yeah but but we are so used to seeing things in in a binary way you know it, it's either yes or no and then there's the the quantum nature of thing there's there's no yes or no how excited are you about virtual reality and artificial intelligence what do you think are the changes that's going to bring you know to a, a, a world in a society very excited both in terms of understanding how the brain works uh and exploring what can we do with it because uh, from a very like let me give you a very simple example pain management yeah so pain is one of the most subjective things in the in the world and um, even today uh, there is no way to objectively uh, measure pain so if 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 you cut your finger how painful it is for you there's no way for me to know that so i can give you a scale i can give you okay out of 1 to 10 with 1 being hardly feel it and 10 being the worst pain imaginable how how much how painful is it and you'll say 7 and i'll say okay fine but i am comparing your 7 to my 7 and i'll think okay what is mine but that could be very different my 7 could be your 1 you'll be like oh this is hardly anything so uh so pain is very subjective and what is very interesting to me is that how virtual reality has a uh, seemingly has a big role to play in pain management because people have done surgeries without anesthesia uh and just using virtual reality like you show a video of you walking around running around in a in a garden and somebody is operating on your leg and you don't feel it because there's nothing wrong with your leg you are running around in a garden what's wrong with your leg so it's it's fascinating and of course there's a lot of research that needs to be done a lot of work needs to happen but i am very excited about it because it's something that instinctively i feel is true because um even from a neuroscience perspective uh, there are there's something called as the gateways of pain so there are so many levels at which pain is modulated so um like at your 
uh, skin level, at your spinal cord level, at your thalamic level, your parietal level. So, yeah, it's not it's not that if you cut your finger, you have to feel pain. Uh, so if you if you are wearing virtual reality goggles and your finger is fine in that virtual reality, you may not feel pain. So uh, I'm just giving you an example, but yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, and some super awesome things are happening. You know, with pain management, there's this lovely uh, experience uh, from somebody has built. You know, there's this because kids, kids, they are really freaked out. You know, when, when to receive vaccine, right? So there's this experience that these guys have built where you know the. The kids are sitting and they put the VR headset on. In the in the experience, there's this cartoon character who, who like a superhero cartoon character. He, he's interacting with you and saying, "You are a superhero, and you know you're gonna get a shield up your arm, and and once you get the shield, you will become a superhero." And, and and the doctors are in tandem. They they also have the VR headset and they've got the injection. And when when he's receiving the the uh, the shield. In the virtual world, they give you an injection. They don't even feel wow. it. So yeah, there's some Amazing. yeah, there's some really freaky thing happening. So that's the reason I, as an individual, have been push driving this conversation about AR, VR, MR, and and I, and I want the world to understand that you know we are living in transformational time. This technology can create a huge transformation in mankind and, and we need to accept that these technologies will help us evolve you know so so besides healthcare education in the space so so since we both know qwr and suraj i mean suraj uh, is a common yeah. friend they are launching vr1 which is india's yeah. first three three of uh, untethered vr it said so uh, in my conversation, he, uh, what I've had with him, so he believes that uh, children aged between 8 and 16 need to be taught you know, using EEG sensors for input early. Uh, just like they are taught to use tools like scissors and scales. So do you agree or disagree? So uh, the idea is very promising, but the, uh, the problem is that EEG has severe limitations. Right. Severe. So um, you can barely tell uh, forget thoughts. Thoughts are uh, very out of the way, but um, one EG can not read very deep. Right. So it can only read electric signals at the surface of your brain. That is one. And second, uh, the best that you can do with EG right now is to tell if the child is concentrating or uh, daydreaming. That's it. Uh, yeah, Mahatak right. we can tell, but, but then there is no way to tell uh, what they're daydreaming about and all that. Like there's no, it's not a mind reading uh, device. Right. So, yeah, uh, a far more promising is functional MRIs, but obviously that's not portable. But most of the good research that we've done uh, into neuroscience has come because of functional MRIs. So, so that requires you to go into that machine. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But nowadays, you know, obviously there are there are people who are developing hand wrists, which, which mm. kind of reads up your 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 neuronal signals. There's this individual which I must uh, you know you know, mention uh, about Brian Johnson. You know, people keep on talking about Elon Musk and uh, because everybody uh, knows what he's doing because obviously he's a great guy. But there's yeah. this guy called Brian Johnson. I think people should check him out. He, his company is called Kernel. And he is, I believe, is at the forefront of neuroscience and brain computer interface. In fact, oh, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so recently, so he's one of those crazy guys who's not coming out and who's just waiting for the right time. Just recently, they, they launched uh, a device called Kernel Flow. It, it's it's a brain computer interface. Now Neuralink obviously has got like a it needs to be a implanted, yeah. you know, which is almost the size of a coin. But here there he, he's created a non-invasive brain computer interface, which he believes in another uh, possibly 13 years. That's that's the time period that he's given. He's saying by 2033, we'll be able to kind of you know do things which is unfathomable right now what are we getting into like your thoughts on neural link and devices such as these yeah so uh, the thing is that there are two ways of looking at it one is academically and one is sociologically the academic perspective is very exciting 
the idea that uh, your understanding of the brain can evolve to an extent that you can actually uh, it put stuff on the brain or in the brain and change the way that um, you know the, the brain functions uh, that means that our understanding of the brain has evolved to that extent which is very exciting from a sociological perspective there are a lot of ethical dilemmas and there is a reason why uh, even neuralink and all these companies will always start off with uh, pushing their products as a cure for specific problems you know like alzheimers or epilepsy or parkinsons because uh, there the ethical dilemma is less but uh, once it is proven to be safe in say an alzheimer's patient or a parkinson patients and they uh, they show that there is some benefit which there might be because in parkinson's we are already using deep brain stimulation and uh, this may be no different so once that happens then uh, people who are not sick will start using them and uh, there i feel that there are ethical dilemmas because for as long as humanity has evolved we have always relied on the brain that we are born with and everything that we have like the whole human experience is defined by the brain that you are born with and our experiences now what if we can start changing it 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 brings into question very fundamental ideas of what is life what does it mean to be a human being what does it mean to be alive uh and those are those are questions that we still don't know the answer to so the thing that worries me is that these questions will come up before we are at a stage that we can answer them and so the answers will be made for us that's the only thing that worries me but from an academic perspective i am very excited because uh i i want to know i want yeah. to know if it's possible yeah yeah Yeah, so so yeah, I I've got this curious bug in me, and I'm always trying to understand and kind of push the limits and see what we humans are capable of. You know, you said uh, the our brains are uh, quite malleable. You also mentioned that uh, it, 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 it's constantly changing. You know, we we are neuroplastic only to like a certain age, maybe only around seven, eight. Are no, we, no, that's not true. Please, uh, please. Our yeah, yeah neuroplasticity carries on. Uh, the right. rate at which it happens is less. Right. But uh, even an adult, there is neuroplasticity. It's just less than before. That's all. Humans, if you go to see, we've always been on a linear growth path. You know, we've taken hundreds and thousands of years to evolve. You know, even from like from the monkeys to even to stand straight, it took thousands of years. <laughs> right. we are here in the 21st century but our brains haven't evolved much you know though, though we got a pre prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, cortex cortex like you mentioned but we ha- haven't evolved much on the other side if you see machines are on an exponential growth okay they they, 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 they there is this constant iteration that this constant growth more more chips tpus uh, gpus cpus addition is making the machine smarter and smarter and smarter i was i'm on this chat group and just couple of days back there's this like a tech chat chat group and there's these bunch of guys i think they saw this uh, demo where uh, the the artificial intelligent mistook a football umpire who was bald right a, a fo- bald football umpire's head to be a ball So, so the, the <laughs> a, a, agent was for calling the ball, and and the chats, chats were like constantly were saying, oh, artificial intelligence is like you know, it's it's so far away, so far away. But I hope that people understand that we are on a linear trajectory, yeah. while exactly. machines are on an exponential growth. Or, or 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 this this you know, we've been laughing at Boston Dynamics these robotics robots falling down, we kick them. Will it come to bite us? is it an existential threat uh, i don't think so i think that uh, at least not in the way that we fear because when we look at machines in fact when we look at anyone we tend to see them as human beings uh we we tend to personify uh, 
in fact we tend to personify even uh, inanimate objects or storms and mountains and i mean we personify everything that's part of the human uh, trait so we personify machines as well and we think that the machine will be angry that we kicked it down because that's what we would do we would have been angry if somebody kicked us but the machine doesn't have emotions so we would say the machine will want revenge no we would have wanted revenge but the machine doesn't care because it's not coded to care whereas we are coded to care so our limbic system evolved to care that is why we care that is why we were angry that is why we would have taken revenge but a machine would not and that is the first thing we have to understand that uh machines are not going to come to get us to take revenge or anything it it all depends on how they are coded and uh the i feel like the biggest threat is that uh human beings would become irrelevant yeah yeah so so I, i don't think we are getting hunted i think we are just going to become irrelevant yeah so so yes i'm i'm, I'm uh, completely with 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 you on that yes so i uh, as far as you said machine is is coded to be uh, uh not take revenge but you know uh, most of the artificial in- intelligence being created right now are either the americans or the china or the yes. europe i mean it's not that we're not developing stuff but more, largely it's been happening over there and and the machines are built with the biases of yeah. its developers so virtual reality right i mean yeah I, 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 as a neuro neurologist what would you be i mean advising developers and content creators what are the do's and do's from your perspective as a neurologist i think it's very 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 important to educate people about reality because that is what happened with gaming as well and uh, the whole fear of uh, you know uh, violent games uh, increasing road violence and all that it's not the game's fault but people need to understand uh, reality a little bit more and for that we have to understand the game makers have to understand the doctors have to understand so the people who are supposed to educate they have to understand first and the real problem is that we ourselves are still learning yeah yeah you know that's the thing so yeah. then uh, game makers know how to code a virtual reality without really knowing how it's affecting the brain so uh, i i think that it's very important to have a conversation on that and uh, in the end what will happen will happen because uh, th- i i feel that just like uh gaming just kept developing so virtual reality is inevitable i don't think it can be stopped the only thing it can be only thing we can do is be sensible about it right that's yeah 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 that i i think yeah, that's uh that's such a important thing you know we need to be sensible about it but you know if, if you go through human history <laughs> we've never yeah <laughs> sensibility is not our strong suit <laughs> yeah, yeah. so yeah but in that no i mean what what keeps you up at night what do you think if you understand about neuroscience will open up a uh, great innovation a- a- in the future so i am essentially optimistic as a person and i am optimistic about the brain's capacity to evolve because that has been the one consistent theme throughout human evolution i think that we have always evolved uh when we needed to so i i think that virtual reality more than anything else will will may spark a revolution in the way we think and the way we see things and it will actually force everybody to realize that if that can be real but you know it's not then what are the other things that we thought was real but may not have been so instead of us confusing virtual reality with real reality i am hoping that virtual reality will make us question real reality and start questioning that how much of this is just drama uh because there is a lot of biases involved so for example the media uh politicians 
they can make us believe a lot of things and they can make us do a lot of things and talk in a lot of ways which may not be true but we will believe it because it is presented in such a way right so i feel like that is an interesting thing that vr can make us question the reality that is presented to us every day right so that will be a very interesting conversation yeah yeah that that's that's so important because so far we are just puppets we are being manipulated by the tech behemoths we are manipulated by politicians we are manipulated by the institutes where we uh, where we take on knowledge from we we be constantly manipulated i mean in ways like i mean i give you a couple of this thing with the uh, social media facebook what yeah. you know, they 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 not just towards buying things then they they i mean everybody knows about cambridge analytica yeah. and how they yeah. kind of uh, manipulated the elections so much which is going on yes i mean i hope i really hope that this this veil is lifted and we the common people start asking the right questions because of our world or we got unlimited resources but it, it, it's so badly divided it's not funny there is just a i think close to 4% or 5% of the global elites they own the 95% of the entire global wealth now that needs to be corrected and that can only happen if we as a collective come together and start asking questions and not be okay with you know what has been served on on a platter i think virtual reality will play a role in kind of pushing the generation and making us understand that we need to start asking deeper questions start asking questions yeah. which will create a better quality of life for us which will create a better environment better world for us and because, but that isn't that what what's it all about i mean in you know we can have this conversation but it all boils down to you know us as a human race creating a better world because someday we're going to die and and what do you leave behind you know and, and yeah. the legacy that you leave behind of yours and, and and the choice we have the choice you know i mean i'm i'm, I'm, I'm blabbering but you know yeah yeah so so lovely is that no, it's that's very true though i mean uh, we do have a choice and uh, while it's true that we will die that's uh, the the more important takeaway is that before we do it's important to uh, try our best to understand uh, things better yeah just to just to get closer to the truth whatever that is yeah and uh, i i feel like it's the truth starts and ends with neuroscience because that's where you see everything from like neuroscience is the ultimate filter uh, everything goes out through that and comes in through that right and everything gets modulated at that level so uh, i think it's very important to understand how the brain uh, perceives things i think it's the most important part that's the reason i said if we understand the language of yeah. what what it's been doing and then we leave it for the future generation just imagine like i mean you will actually be in the matrix movie we'll be able to upload and download what whatever you want at the at yeah. the click of a button we'll have knowledge being downloaded and yes i think we'll we we'll live in a fantastic world our thoughts about i said we'll be dying soon i mean we've come to a point where we are even asking questions whether you know that that can be age reversal or you can be uploaded on a on a computer yeah. if if the entire data can be a cognitive structure data can be captured and uploaded so so we are living on a fantastic fantastic times what's going to happen next is is yeah. anybody's guess and i personally am super excited uh, so that was a Likewise. pleasure and an honor to chat with you and i hope I, i can do this again maybe delve deeper only and only on neuroscience understand what the brain is all about because i guess yes like you said it's the key to everything if we understand that there's going to be things which will open up which will make yeah. a, a better society better world you know so so on that note if, if, to my listeners if you like what you see and yeah please press the subscribe button until next time see you guys bye bye thank you thank you thank you so much thank you thank you